Uh, good afternoon or good evening, uh, wherever your time zone uh, might be. Uh, I hope everyone is well. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm going to handle the, uh, the quick intro MC duties, um, and then we will begin our program. So welcome to today's Herb Labalin Lecture Series presentation of On the Origin of Bold and Fat Faces. My name is Alexander. I am one of the instructors in the Typer Cooper program, which is pre presenting the, the talk today. For those of you who might be joining us for the first time, uh, but I'm sure there's a lot of uh, familiar faces or uh, familiar names in, in attendance today. But if you're joining us for the first time today, uh, Typer Cooper is a postgraduate certificate program in typeface design that has a dedicated annual lecture series uh, called the Herbal Balan Lecture Series. Uh, this lecture series runs uh, within the structure of the extended uh, typeface design um, program, which is part of Typer Cooper. Uh, and uh, we have uh, usually 12 lectures uh, per year. And so we're uh, one third of the way in. Um, the program starts in October and it runs into uh, August. So it kind of follows an academic calendar. Um, so we're one third of the way in, we're starting our, our uh, second uh, third of, of the lectures. Uh, this is the first one of, of, of that event, of that series. Uh, Hippie Cooper also has a lot of type design, lettering, typography related workshop um, on offer. We also organize the typographics conference and festival every year. And you can find out more information about the program on our website coopertype.org and I will post the link to that in chat and here it is. Um, the, um, as I said, this is the first of four lectures for uh, what we call, I guess, like the, the, the spring uh, term of, of the lecture series. We have three more coming up. I'll give you um, a, round, a quick rundown of those next week uh, on Monday. Uh, March 1st at 6.30 New York time uh, p.m. We will have Cyrus Highsmith with us and he is going to give a talk called Preoccupied uh, where he'll focus on his process, his sketchbooks, typefaces, printmaking, postcards, and other things he does to keep himself occupied. Um, the next lecture we're going to have is on March 29th, uh, so we'll skip, skip a few weeks. Um, that uh, talk will be at 12.30 p.m. Uh, New York time, same time as this. Uh, and that talk will be uh, a group presentation by Marta Bernstein, uh, James Clough, Alessandra Colizzi, and Ricardo Oloco. Um, they will give a talk on the history of Nebbiolo type foundry. That's called a curtain raiser for the Nebbiolo story. And the week after that, on April 5th uh, at 6.30 p.m., um, we will have with us Peter Bain, uh, who's going to give a talk called Rendering 25 Years. And it's a talk focusing on the lettering instruction in United States during the 25 year period from 1945 to 19, 1970. Um, and what we can learn from that. Um, so kind of focusing on American tradition of lettering within the commercial arts uh, and kind of that, that sort of golden age of uh, lettering in the United States, especially focusing on the instruction of lettering. So do register for these talks and I will post the link to that in the chat as well. So it's in there. Um, and periodically, I'll try to um, add the links as we as we go through. But do sign up for those. We have, we have a really great lecture series. Um, we also have an extensive video archive, which you could see by going to that link. I just posted um, about five, uh, close to six years of lectures uh, in our archive are available right now. And for that, I wanted to thank Hafler and Co for their financial support of the recordings of this lecture series. And you could see um, the archive of those lectures on, on our website, coopertype.org, or by going to our Vimeo channel. Uh, this talk is being recorded and will be available to watch later as well. So again, thanks to the generosity from Hefler and Co for allowing us to record this lecture. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, uh, we will have a Q&A session following the, the presentation, uh, about 15 minutes. So please send your questions in um, by using the Q&A button. So we have two windows. There's a chat function, and there's the Q&A function. Um, for questions, please send them to the Q&A. That way we can, we can see them. Uh, we can, we can uh, ask those questions at the end in the wrap up. 
Um, and when you chat, uh, do remember that there's a, a feature in chat that you can uh, send a message to panelists and attendees or, or just to attendees. Um, so if you wanted to chat with uh, everyone who's on, uh, on the chat, uh, use the panelists and the attendees. Otherwise, if you send it to the panelists, only um, the folks uh, uh, on the back end will see it. Um, the video for everyone is off and the audio is off, so no need to mute yourself. Um, but feel free to use the chat and the Q&A, which I see is, 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 is being used to uh, make note of where everyone is coming from. So thanks so much for, for that. It's always really great to see like where, where folks are joining us from. Um, with that, um, it is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's lecturer, Sebastian Morligam. Uh, I'm really glad to have him back. Um, I think this is our second or third time Sebastian's with us. Uh, I would love uh, if Sebastian was here physically in person, but, but uh, you know, the world is the way it is. Uh, we, we have to make this work, but it's, it's fantastic that we can have Sebastian joining us. Um, Sebastian is a teacher and researcher at the ISAD, uh, the MN uh, School of Art and Design in France. He is also a founder of the Bibliothèque Typographique uh, collection uh, for the Ypsilon Editeur um, publishing. Sebastian has co-authored several books, including these wonderful books on Jose Mendoza Almeida and uh, a book on Roger Escafon. Uh, he has written many articles and has curated several conferences and exhibitions on graphic design, typography, and type design. He holds a PhD from the University of Reading in the UK. Uh, with that, I will let Sebastian take over, who is joining us uh, from France today. Sebastian, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, well, it's very impressive to be here, even though I am remote, <clears throat> far from snow in New York City. Uh, I can see that there are almost 500 people. That's very scary. My goodness. Well, I'd better start, I guess. So I'm going to share the screen. And I hope everything will be fine. And that's it. Is it okay? Well. Looks good. Okay, thank you for confirming it. Uh, I'm not used that much to Zoom, but I'm a fast learner. So this is called Dusting Latin Type History, number one. <laughs> Maybe there will be a number two someday. And so I'm going to talk about the origin of bold and fat faces. So, okay. First of all, I have plenty of people to thank um, throughout the years. Uh, it's a long list. Um, people who provided information, materials, or access to materials, and people who also welcomed me um, recently uh, for previous versions of this lecture. Um, so I have plenty to say, and I'm very, very grateful um, to have been able to carry on some of these researches, especially the work of Justin House and, and James Mosley. I'm going to talk about, I guess, later. So thank you very much, all of you. As, an, as a good omen, I'm going to quote a tweet by Catherine Dixon, tweet, uh, quoting, sorry, Michael Twyman. I'm not tidying up graphic design. I'm opening it up. So I think uh, it's a good watchword to try to explain what I've been doing um, these last months uh, regarding this project, uh, project that started more like a hobby, uh, truthfully. And of course, uh, the more you enjoy doing it, not as a professional thing, uh, inevitably it becomes something that could be shared uh, over the years. And I don't know where I'm going with these things, but um, it will, at least today is an opportunity to share this, uh, this uh, stage of the research. Um, actually, um, when uh, I started researching the history of modern faces uh, for a PhD I did in the University of Reading uh, between 2010 and 2014, um, I got interested in, in bold and fat faces. And uh, at first I, at, I thought it would be simply just a few paragraphs and then uh, it became a section of my thesis. And this is how I, I 
really got interested in, in the origin and development of modern fat faces. And last year, um, I got an offer from Jérôme Pnebuch of Poem Edition to make a small booklet. And, and I thought that this would be a good topic. So this is something that was published uh, in May, I think. Uh, it's a small booklet and it's mainly de derived and, uh, from the PhD uh, section. And I thought I would be done with this. And then, uh, of course, uh, a few months later, I had to continue because uh, Thomas Marchand asked me to give a talk for the Atelier National de Recherche Typographique. And then I had to work more. And then I thought it would be a good topic for uh, Type Art Cooper. And, and so here we are today. Um, so I have plenty of things to share. Uh, I, I may forgot forget, sorry, some of these things. So um, I'm, I'm warming up <laughs> slowly and we will start now, I guess, seriously. These words are from Paul Barnes. And this is one of the most recent, and I would say positive definition of the fat face. The fat face is a joyful expression of an idea to make something as bold as can be executed with real vigor and the utmost conviction. And what you see, this is a typeface called Eisenbart. And this is possibly one of the most recent incarnation of, I would say, the modern fat face. Okay, so for many people, a fat face would be that. But a fat face might be a genre, but it's, I would say, it's also a state of mind, because it can also be something that is mainly derived from an original source but is going elsewhere like Margarita, uh, typeface by Alejandro Lo Celso. And so it looks like, of course, I would say a historical typeface, but this is something else, still contemporary. But for other people nowadays, a fat face can be this, uh, The Wonderful Zroy by Tarja Petrova. So, I mean, the quote of Paul Barnes, of course, is still matching with, I would say, the typeface uh, that I uh, chose, and I could have chosen more typefaces um, made uh, very recently. So a fat face can be a lot of things. What I'm going to talk about, uh, obviously, is the original um, aspects of this design. And so for so many people, uh, it looks like a fat face is obviously always derived from the modern face as explained simply and accurately um, Nicolette Gray in this article on the subject in 1955. And you can see this beautiful small drawing that says it all. So you have a Roman, then you have the modern face, vertical axis, uh, heavy contrast between thick and thin, and then you increase the contrast, you increase the thick parts and you have a fat face. And nowadays, if for instance, uh, you look at the Brunel family by Paul Barnes uh, up to the Eisenbaum uh, fat version, um, it seems to us that it's very natural to think the fat face as a, I would say, a progression, something that comes from a regular uh, weight, but of course it, it's absolutely not the case. And it's very difficult when you get into, uh, I would say, so-called uh, origin of the, the fat face. Um, there are many stories, I would say many myths uh, to get rid of. So, and it's very difficult because there are, I would say, it's not one design, it's a series of design that happened almost at the same time or successively. Some of them completely disappeared. So imagine that within a period of 20 years, there, there was a huge succession of, of fat face design or bold design coming from uh, British foundries. But the term fat face uh, is not, was not created in the early 19th century, actually. It's much more older. And uh, to my 
knowledge it first appears in the book of Joseph Moxon, Mechanical Exercises, second volume. And first you have a definition, fat face or fat letter is a broad stemmed letter. And if you look into the letter cutting section of Moxon's book, he explains very straightforward what is, I would say, a fat face. It's a face with a stem who has fat stroke and is defining, uh, as you can see, what are the fat strokes. So it's a non nonsense definition. So the stem or broad stroke in the letter is called fat. But it doesn't mean that a letter, of course, with broad strokes uh, are obviously fat faces. And Robert Fawn um, is still nowadays cre credited as being the, yeah, yeah, the inventor of the fat face. So I would say it's partly true. Uh, it's quite a difficult story uh, because um, it has been repeated, copied, you know, and even today in some recent books, uh, you will be able to read that uh, Robert Fawn uh, created the fat face. So the earliest uh, mention crediting Fawn with this invention is dated around 1817 by William Savage. So what he say, he has been principally instrumental in the revolution that has taken place in posting bills by the introduction of fat types. <laughs> And Savage is followed a few years later by um, Thomas Curson and Sub, both were printers, saying the extremely bold and fat letter now prevalent in job printing owes in its introduction principally to Mr. Fawn, a spirited and successful letter founder recently deceased. And towards the end of the 19th century, um, Talbot Bain Reed, um, who was the son of Charles Reed, who bought the Fan Street Foundry, uh, that is the foundry uh, created by Robert Fawn, uh, was gave, Talbot Bain Reed gave a talk and he wa when he was uh, addressing the fat face, this is what he said, the new Roman was barely established as the prevailing fashion when vulgar taste for fatter faces asserted itself. The demand was promptly responded to by the founders of the day. Robert Fawn leading the way. Others outstripped him in the race. And about 1820, or rather before, a face like that, before you, he was giving a talk, so he was showing an example, was both fashionable and popular for certain works. So this is how Fawn, uh, uh, during the 19th century, was considered the man who made it basically, but not only him. So I want to show you a bit of context. Um, London, England, Great Britain, um, in the last decades of the 18th century was witnessing uh, the gradual increase of posters, placards, public notices, and also uh, there was a progressive shift uh, uh, in shop fronts, building fronts um, between, I would say, pictorial signs and scriptural signs. So what is interesting is to imagine how um, this society and a city like London was uh, witnessing this change and having more and more information uh, in the streets. So of course, as you can see here on this building, the old opera house, you have both posters uh, announcing events and the sign of Rigaud's fencing academy. So you have the cohabitation of printed matter and signed painting. And imagine um, this uh, buzzing uh, atmosphere streets full of painted signs still, of course, but the increase of written uh, lettered signs as well, and things that were on buildings, but also that were moving like on stage coaches. So um, there's a lot of, uh, I would say, examples to try to locate 
uh, as much as possible. So um, one can mainly rely on engravers, um, caricaturists, all these people who I would say um, documented and sometimes with much accuracy uh, what was happening uh, in the city life. And especially I, I like very much this uh, etching by Thomas Rawlinson, it's a sign painter's workshop as you can see. So here you have the team of people preparing um, the pots, the pencils, and then on the right you have one sign painter. This is a very great image because you can see accurately how he's working. So we are in seven, around 1790 and uh, I take it as an example um, of the increasing uh, presence of information uh, in the streets. So information, textual information that is made by hand, unpainted, uh, and also printed with types. So a few words about, about Robert Fawn. Um, Born in 1753, he was an apprentice in the foundry of Thomas Cottrell, um, very likely in the 1770s uh, when this specimen was uh, published. Um, the, um, how can I call that? The type scene uh, at this time uh, in, in England and in London was dominated, of course, by the Caslon family and Thomas Cottrell was an ex-employee of the foundry of William Caslon II. And um, he set up his foundry in the 1760s. And he was credited to uh, design um, placard letters. That is, as you can see, big letters for posters, public notices. And at this time, such letters were made with uh, just a few uh, techniques. Basically, uh, it was very hard to, to cast letter of that size uh, with the traditional method. So of course, it was possible to use sound casting, uh, which means that you would uh, engrave your letters and then cast them in sand. Uh, but of course, it was quite tedious because you could only use the, the sand mold once, okay? And there were also several techniques using um, brass and um, plates to, to cut letters. I will come back later on the subject. But there was an increasing need for such big types. And the Castleon foundry, William II and the III, uh, in the 1770s, 1780s, uh, they had a huge range of big type, the biggest size being 99 pica, as you can see on this uh, broadsheet specimen. So the foundry specialized as well uh, on these large letters. And um, without a doubt, I would say that the best uh, stuff uh, was coming from the Castle and Foundry at the time. Sebastian? Can I interrupt yes. you for one second? Uh, the slides look a little bit uh, fuzzy. Do you mind checking, like without quitting anything, if you go to the three dots at the top of the Zoom panel and go to the options, um, there's a setting to optimize for video. It is already optimized. It is, if you uncheck it, sometimes it actually is strangely Zoom does it the other way. Um, let's see if it oh, will get- it now? Is it better? Should I carry on like this or? Okay. That looks better, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for the interruption. Okay. Um, back to the subject. So as I just uh, explained, uh, the Castellon foundry was leading the way uh, on the front of the large letters, but other foundries such as Fry uh, was having uh, smaller sizes like this. There was a change in design. And um, another example coming from the, the foundry of um, the ex foundry, the later British foundry, sorry, of uh, St the Stephensons. Um, these types were cut by Richard Austin and probably cast in sand. So in the 1780s, 1790s in London, it was quite easy to have, uh, I would say, a good range of um, big size letters for posters. 
as you could notice, uh, these letters were only capital letters. Um, so, Robert Fawn. In 1785, um, Thomas Cottrell died. And um, until 1794, uh, it is not known uh, who was uh, managing his foundry. Um, Fawn left probably the foundry before the death of Cottrell. And it was established in the Barbican area as an independent letter maker. It's not sure that Fawn himself cut punches. It is possible, but um, he was doing different kind of jobs um, involving engraving. In 1794, he was able to buy uh, the foundry of his ex-master, Cottrell. And the same year, he issued the first specimen. So what you see here is the unique copy of this 1794 phone specimen, the first one. It's at the Type Archive in London. And as you can see, these are the biggest sizes. So he also has a 19 line spica, uh, like the Castellan foundry. So some of these types are coming from the stock of Cottrell, but some of those possibly were cut by or under the supervision of form. But as you can see, these are not bold types at all. We are not there yet. These are the biggest sizes that you can see in this specimen. Four years later, um, Fawn is publishing his second specimen, or I would say the second known specimen. Again, this is still a unique copy that is in the Bodleian Library collection. And so again, you can see the 19 lines by cut. This is the same, but in this case, it, it, there are also lower cases. So. Um, I don't know if these, of course, if these lower cases were cut in between or if they were already ready uh, four years before. In the 16 lines by car, you also have this example of lower cases. So um, in this specimen, which is also a very interesting uh, piece of typography because Fawn is renovating uh, uh, completely, um, not only the stock of his foundry, but also is moving towards what is going to be called soon uh, this modern uh, printing types. Uh, he's doing a lot of work, but I wouldn't say yet, of course, but uh, he's thinking of doing bolder types, okay? When you look at just one example uh, among thousands, so this is a theater poster and some of the types uh, I showed you, uh, so these large letters, of course, they would be used uh, in this case to set names of people, but also the, the, the titles of the, the shows and the pieces. As you can see, there's already a clear typographic hierarchy in with such long posters, okay? So this is the end of 1798, the same year of the, the, the specimen I just showed you. And, and it's very, this is a very funny example. This is just basically one or two weeks later. And um, you might think that from your screen, this Mr. Parker is something, of course, that looks clumsy and it is clumsy. So maybe it was roughly cut in wood, but actually uh, it was made by hand. So that's an interesting sign uh, because it seems like there was, I don't know if at the printing office, they wanted to have something slightly bolder, but of course they, they, they didn't have the type yet. And someone simply roughly made it by hand. So it's the only copy, uh, of course, I know. And I haven't found similar example yet, yet but uh, I hope to find more in, in the future. But you can see that there's a need for visual appeal for something that uh, um, just gets more attraction here. But you can also get more attraction, uh, of course, if you would cut in reverse title, uh, a title or a name uh, with a woodcut uh, in other posters, like in these examples, there's a mix of uh, printing type, metal type. There are some made to measure wood type, but also these 
uh, huge pieces of of, uh, of woodcuts that would be inserted in the, the composition. And this is a practice that lasts uh, in the early decades of the, the 19th century. So it's another way to, to attract uh, people in the streets. So fawn, okay, fawn is a scapegoat, according to a few people who wrote uh, in the 20th century, early 20th century. Uh, so Updike saying is that he's responsible for the vilest form of type invented up to that time. Fawn specimen book of improved types of 1803 should be looked at as a warning of what fashion can make men do. And he was followed by Morrison a few years later. Fawn's fat grotesque was the first original English design to make an impression abroad. With Fawn was produced a letter during 1803, which was a novelty, distinct and dreadful. Well, this is Morrison, and Morrison most of the time is rubbish about historical things. So this is the boldest type that you can find in 1803 specimen. The Third specimen of form at Simbright Library. Again, a unique copy. How shocking. <laughs> so there's a huge confusion that was made by Updike and Morrison. And I'm not sure they even saw this specimen because when you, 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 I mean, when you open it for the first time, you're just like, okay, it's going to be very full of fat faces. And then, yeah, that's it. That's the boldest weight that you can find here. But Form must be credited, I think, with being very likely one of the first uh, London type founders to introduce um, text types, medium sizes. And these types, uh, as you can see here, I hope it's not a good photo, um, but um, it's just to give an idea that we are entering at the, in the early years of the 19th century in a completely different world. And uh, the types that would be called much later modern faces are getting into fruition. Uh, and Fawn is showing in this 1803 specimen, you can see the sheet is, is uh, dated 1802, um, types with slightly increased stems fixed. And um, it needs to be said that a few years earlier, um, the Caslon and Catherwood foundry, uh, and more especially uh, Elizabeth Caflon, who was managing the foundry in the last years of the 18th century, uh, hired uh, a punch cutter called John Isaac Drury. And uh, Drury was one of the first to cut these new types. Uh, and for me and for other people like James Mosley, who, who definitely was the first to put the attention on these types. This is the template of the modern face. And from the beginning of the 19th century, there was a competition, of course, between the founders. And when you look at another specimen of Castle and Catherwood uh, a few years later, so you can definitely see that they have an increasing range of medium uh, text typefaces with an increase, of course, of the, the, the fixed strokes for the Roman types, as well as for the Italic. So I'm not going to talk today that much about the text uh, sizes uh, with uh, increased weight. That is a totally uh, different subject. I, I will stay on the, the big types for posters and other documents. So very quickly, I would say uh, around 1805, 1806, uh, you can see the development uh, of these uh, medium big uh, sizes and uh, lottery notices, for instance, and lottery bills are beginning to, to use these new types. So a lot of work is made with metal types, but somehow and this is very puzzling when you, you, you begin to see early evidences. Again, fatter types were made, not by type, I would say, 
metal types, but uh, cut in wood. So this is one of the earliest examples. It is dated December 1805, uh, and it's coming from um, the, the lottery company of Thomas Bish, uh, a man who is credited with many, many, uh, I would say, actions, aggressive publicity, advertising in the streets, and, uh, and it's quite uh, amazing to see that some of the, the, the best examples of these um, fat faces cut in wood uh, can be, were used by uh, Bish. But uh, one has to remember that uh, in these years, in 1805, a lot of things were happening uh, in the streets and sign paintings. And also, uh, I think we should credit more uh, a lot of unknown woodcutters. And when uh, you, you discover this amazing piece of article uh, that was actually discovered by Justin House more than 15 years ago uh, at the British Library, and it was reproduced by James Mosley uh, on his blog online. So yeah, this is amazing that this is an article complaining about the, the, the I would say, the the increasing appearance on shop fronts of these uh, fake uh, antique uh, sans serif letter forms. But what I like in, in this, um, this article is that the only way I would say to translate to show these, these signs is by using woodcuts. So, so there was a lot of things happening alongside the, the type founding business. That's the idea. But things happened, of course, during the second part of the first decade of the 19th century. Um, so this is a precious specimen that was not published by a foundry, but by a printer, Harris, in Liverpool. And so, so far, I, I, I don't know where uh, he could purchase these, these big types, but he was one of the first in 1807 to collect uh, and to show such examples. So, He's not showing types by size, but he's showing them by number. And he's, I, I like very much the way uh, in the foreword of this specimen he's talking about that, saying, I hope also that I have been not unsuccessful, unsuccessful sorry, in the selection of my other funds and that the larger sorts will be found to present a broad and bold display, indispensable in the kind of printing for which they are intended. Well, things are neat and clear here. As you can see the words that are used to set mail coach, it looks like some of these letter forms um, were used um, to advertise um, the travels uh, for the stage coach, coaches, sorry. But you can see here that, that, that of course, uh, we are moving into a specific direction that the weight general weight of these letters, capital lowercase is increasing. Um, it's a specific uh, design direction. And in another um, copy of this specimen, uh, I could even find uh, extra sheets. I'm not sure they were made around 1807. Maybe they were made uh, shortly afterwards and added in the specimen. I didn't see the, the original uh, object. But then you can see that things were really getting uh, bolder for this kind of use. So between 1805 and 1810, this is when things happen. And we can see this same kind of design uh, in these folded sheets in the specimen of Fry and Steel from 1808. So we are yeah, around the same time, same words, more or less, bath, coach. This example, um, but I'm, I'm showing you as well this 12 point uh, that was commented by uh, Nicolette Gray in 1938 and saying, so it's very interesting how she's taking the, this, this design, saying in this letter of Fry, the process seems to have reached a norm. So she's talking about the process, something that had an origin and then we, we, that is reaching uh, this norm. It is a superb wide generous letter magnificently Roman, but with a good deal less of order and more of Pomp than Trajan's classic. It is a letter which falls into no category. 
in the process of fattening Cottrell's ordinary 18th century capital has changed. The modeling has been exaggerated and the shading become uniformly vertical and the forms of the letters have grown softer and rounder. Yet it is not a modern phase for the shading is quite gradual and the bracketing very full. Nor are the fixed strokes thick enough, nor are the thin strokes thin enough for it to be a fat phase. Okay, judgment was done. But um, one can ask uh, if it Cottrell's letters that were very different in terms of design could have been the origin. I would say that um, some of the example I showed you and especially maybe some of the letters of form may have uh, influenced this direction, this new norm, or maybe it's coming from uh, someone else, another foundry. Another specimen that is uh, sometimes uh, mentioned, but again, never shown. And this is from Bower Bacon and Bower in Sheffield. So not everything was happening in, in London, of course. Uh, and you can see uh, in this specimen, again, I guess it's the only copy still in the type archive, uh, how, how clear or how neat are these big sizes. So we have from 16, Roman to 19 line spica uh, italic, up to 20 line spica. So definitely the biggest size that was uh, possible to, to, to purchase at the time uh, in 1810. So we are witnessing something that was happening in, in these years. So this is, I would say the first um, pool of bold and fat types. There is also this great example uh, that is approximately 24 line spica big, uh, made to measure definitely wood letters, one a great piece of, of type and great piece of, of, of graphic design. So something that is was, was found, I guess, by Michael Twyman and uh, it's in the Bodleian library and uh, so, as you can see, when, when the, there was a need for bigger size, it was not a problem to, to cut them on purpose, like in this example, and I'm pretty sure there are other examples to, to find. Back to Fawn, okay? We are not done with him. 1810, the fourth known specimen. This one, again, is a unique copy in a private collection in London. So this is the stuff that Thorn was doing in the previous years. So something that now looks quite familiar for you. The, the biggest size in this specimen is this 16 line spica in capital and in lower cases. So this, this is an interesting object because there, there's, it is really a mixed bag of old things coming from 1798 and 1803. And these new designs, um, there are not so many uh, big sizes, but you can see that we are in, in the same uh, direction of the previous examples. But the, the consistency is, is quite shaky. As you can see, there are many differences from one weight to another. And, and here, something else is appearing. As you can see, the contrast has been increased between the thick and fins. So are we sneaking around the new design? Maybe. So this example I want to show next to this one. Um, of course, the type specimens are very useful artifacts and objects and very helpful to try uh, sketching a, a timeline, um, but nothing is set uh, in stone, of course. And uh, one must be ready to change uh, the possible chronology. And for instance, this uh, four line pica coming from Castle and Cafferwood, um, it is not known when it was actually cut um, and, and sold, but I wanted to show it next to this uh, version from form because you can see that the, I would say there is a proximity in terms of design between uh, these two same size. 
And here, uh, just to, to give you a clear idea, so same size, two different spirits. Number one, number two, first one, yeah, cut around or before 1810 and the second one in 1798. So you can see how much uh, have changed uh, in more than 10 years in, in terms of um, typeface design. And of course, um, these types, they made their way in many printed uh, documents, theater poster. So this is one, uh, uh, this is 1809. So you can see this is almost, almost uh, set with this new bold uh, and fat faces. Playbills, um, researching uh, playbills is a hell of a task because you have tens of thousands of examples. And nowadays, many, many uh, documents uh, are online and, and it's very difficult to accurately uh, assess the introduction of these types because one theater in London, for instance, would work with a printer uh, possibly um, having an agreement with one of the founders and then also possibly willing to, to be uh, up to date with the introduction of these new types. But then you can see that uh, the hierarchy of the typography is changing very quickly between the use of these different weights in different sizes uh, using capital and, and lower cases. Okay, so we have another player getting into the game William Caslon Jr. or William Caslon IV, so the grand grandson of William Caslon, um, who, sorry, who began to, to manage the foundry um, of his father around 1807. And around 1810, um, he, he published a, a notice about an invention uh, that it took credit for, which is called sans pareil matrices. So I'm going to quote James Mosley himself because it's much better to explain what is a sans pareil matrices. It's from an article of James called sans pareil matrices published in Matrix in 2003. Um, in a sans pareil matrix, the shape of the letter was cut or pierced through a plate of copper or brass in the manner of a stencil and another plate was attached to make the face of the letter. The principle is simple, but in practice, the making of the matrices called for great skill. All the counters in letters like A and B and A and B, capital and lower cases, had to be made as isolated shapes and reverted to the face plate. Moreover, the profile of each letter had to be sloped as it is in the matrix struck with a punch so that the cast type would separate readily. And each part had to be made with such precision that no metal could penetrate between the two plates and spoil the outline of the face of the type. So this is apparently a new process that was introduced uh, by, by William Caslon IV, but there are accounts that are not, uh, I would say not firm enough uh, in the late 1770s, 80s, that uh, um, such similar uh, processes were used already uh, to cast um, big types. So here are some examples uh, of these early sans pareil types uh, from William Caslon. As you can see, there's something that is very crispy, sharpy, neat in these early examples. So. We are moving at the beginning of the, uh, the 1810s into a new direction uh, on the front of bold and fat faces. So this specimen again uh, is a, another unique copy in the type archive. And it's quite delightful to be able to find examples again of posters and in this case uh, fully using uh, different sizes and designs of bold and fat faces. So yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it was a fashion, but uh, somehow printers were definitely uh, aware of this quick change 
in the design of types. And in 1814, um, Robert Thorne uh, published his latest known uh, specimen. So again, it's another rare document. And you can see uh, it's a damaged document, but it's a precious one. And uh, the cover is using several weights of his own types. So we are definitely here with, with fat faces. So it, um, again, it's a document that is interesting because it's showing different designs together. So 24 lines by car. So this is one of the biggest uh, types produced at the time. So as if it was a competition between founders. So it's not known if uh, these were uh, made using the sound casting process or another process with um, brass plates. You can see figures. And this example, hello. Um, so uh, you can see it's said cast in mode and matrices, meaning that Fawn used the process of um, William Castlon the fourth, because uh, very quickly over founders decided to, it, it would be more uh, easy to, to use this sanspare process. But in the, the term sanspare is accredited uh, with uh, William Castle the fourth, but in other foundries you would find this uh, phrasing cast in mold and matrices. And here again to see how, how fast uh, designs uh, were evolving. So this is again a 10 line spiker, number one. Why there's number one. Here is the same weight four years before what I showed you previously, just to give you an idea. Okay, so things are getting more thicker. And there's number two, and you can see that the design is something else. So around this date, I would say around the, the, the middle of the decade, we are getting into fatter faces. And the contrast is even more huge between the thick and fins. And for, for many decades, um, the most known specimen that uh, one could uh, see was a specimen by the foundry of Vincent Figgins from 1815. Um, there was uh, in the 1960s a facsimile published by Bertolt Warp. So this is a good, easy reference to, to find. And um, so it was possible to, how can I say, to believe that Figgins was a forerunner uh, on the front of these new faces. So Figgins, uh, as you can see, casting mold in matrices would uh, use the Sanspare uh, process. And here are some examples of the, his large sizes. And you can see from 10 to nine line spiker, uh, the, the, the design looks the same, but it doesn't have, I would say, a, a maximal uh, consistency. And again, when it, it's, a, it's really uh, incredible to, to see these bigger, fatter types in use uh, in posters. So this is one of the best examples uh, from the same period that one can find. But not everything is related to type. And uh, uh, when you're digging in the sides and you're looking in over uh, uh, printed um, matter, you, you can find interesting examples made by woodcutters. So, for instance, in this, this is this lottery ticket where you can see here, this is a wood engraving. Uh, as this is a fat Tuscan, one of the earliest examples that you can find here. And, and it's very uh, rewarding to start looking in, in different kinds of publications and see the work of engravers that are also developing different styles of these bold and fat letter forms, uh, such as in this example. So, uh, I could go on and show you more things, uh, but just to, to give you an insight of the richness that was happening um, at the time. And 1820 is a key year because this is the year uh, of the death of Fawn. 
uh, he died in March 1820. His health was uh, quite frail in the previous years, and he tried to, to, to sell his foundry around 1817, but he, he couldn't sell it so. Um, and the same year, in this specimen by Castlan and Kafferwood, and you can see that the competition is still uh, continuing, 25 line spiker. So I guess this is the biggest size that was made at the time, biggest, fattest. And then the, the variety of, of the fat faces is also continuing to expand. So I'm showing you just the five line pica example, 60 points. And this is the same size coming from Fawn. So this is a specimen published in 1821 by William Forogood, uh, who bought the foundry of Fawn uh, a few months after his death. And um, he published his first specimen, um, so the, the following year. And most of the examples of this in this specimen are actually coming from uh, Fawn, of course. So, and, and it's quite amazing that you imagine that for the same size, this, this fine line spike at 60 points, you have at least five different designs. And of course, as you can, you can see that it's, the weight is increasing and the design is evolving. So, so now we are facing a, a, an even fatter face here. And this is the same type. So this five line spike at number five in use in this theater playbill. So it's a hell of a work uh, to, to try to cross-reference the types shown in the specimens and the types used in all these documents. So there's a lot of work for many people. Uh, I'm not sure if I want to go this way in the next years, but uh, I think it's very important if you want to explain what is a typeface, not only to rely on type specimens. Type specimens are uh, significant uh, pieces of truth, but they are not the whole truth. What's more interesting is how these uh, printers were using, but also I would say very likely supporting the development of these bigger and fatter faces. And when, um, when you're trying to find examples uh, of yeah, around the 1820s, so you can see that they were used for different kind of examples, so, such as this public notice uh, that is also a piece of history because it was um, printed a few weeks before the, the, the massacre of Petaloo uh, in Manchester in 1819. And such events like the death of uh, the King George III. Or a handbill advertising this new established patriotic cheap bread, um, et cetera. And so there, there are plenty of examples um, starting in the 1820s uh, and, and basically typefaces were here for good, but they were not the only um, faces of attraction, if I could put it like this. Slime simply because in between, at, in the beginning of the, the 1810s, there was another bigger, fatter design that appeared, the so-called antique. Uh, and you can see here in this example that the, 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 the Nigel, how uh, it is more powerful already uh, in terms of weight and size uh, than the, the fat faces, the modern fat faces. And, and it's very funny to see this, this, this text in this Spiggin specimen in 1823, the increased fatness in job letter is an improvement, but is it not in many instances carried to an extreme? How far can too far go? And um, what is for me also very, very uh, interesting is to find examples uh, of the transformation of daily life in British cities and in London mainly as documented by uh, the German born artist Charles Schaff, for example, one of the best graphic witnesses of this time. 
So as you can see, these um, people post sign posters, uh, sticking bills on the walls, and already the huge competition happening in terms of size, in terms of styles here. And in the collections of the British Museum, you have wonderful uh, pencil drawings of Schaff, so such as this example. So it's difficult to, to assess the accuracy of his drawings, because when you see this, you can notice that some lines are definitely Tuscans, fat faces, but some looks like uh, Saint Serif, for instance. And there's this wonderful building, the London Letter Manufactory, um, a building that, uh, this is the only image, of course, the only document uh, showing this manufactory. And I did a bit of research and I have to carry on, but it seems like uh, uh, in the following decade, they, it was still going on under another name and they were still doing porcelain letters for uh, shop fronts. But look at that, look at the differences in terms of design. And uh, for this is one of the examples where Chaff is very accurate with the designs of the, the letter forms. But not all information is uh, meant to stay uh, fixed uh, on walls. And of course, you would have this uh, bored men traveling around the streets with information. So for lottery, for instance, or here, as you can see on the right uh, of this uh, lithograph, and you have this man carrying a picket board, uh, and you cannot, maybe you can read the name Bish again, uh, still uh, active on the front of, of the lottery. So information would be meant to stay, but also meant to travel by men, by foot, I would say. And in the 1830s, in between, fat faces would continue to be designed, not especially in the large sizes, but uh, more in the small sizes. So I'm not going to talk about it today because we could spend one another hour. And I, I, I'm pretty sure that you must be tired already. <laughs> um, but the, the uh, of course, the 1830s is the decade of the rise of the Saint Serif uh, in, in, in the Great Britain. Saint Serif, grotesque, uh, depending on which foundry, Saint Serif being the term uh, used by Figgins. So you can see one of the, the I would say, the, the boldest examples that Figgins has been produced, this 29 Pica Saint Serif. So when you look at that, of course, you would think that this is an invention of the time. Well, look at that. This was made for a brand of fermented fish sauce in Spain so be between the, the, the second and the third century of our era. It's, a, it's quite a small uh, example. I mean, the, the, it's less than one centimeter height and maybe six centimeter uh, wide. It is, this is, we, we cannot see the first letter, it's A, E, M, H A, you can notice the ligature, of course, and I, A M A. So it's a brand. It's uh, I wouldn't say use the, the word company, but uh, fish fermented fish sauce sold in in Anforas was quite popular in, in uh, the south of Europe, and uh, there was a need for branding. And it's quite amazing when you discover this example that. Uh, Sans serif fat faces uh, were already there at the time. And this is another view of the object but just to give you an idea. I'm pretty sure there are other examples and it's just the tip of the iceberg. But this is something that I discovered very recently. So that puts perspective, you know, and not everything was invented in the 19th century or the 20th century or the 20th century. But in the 20th, 21st century, we can, revisit and invent different things. And I would like to end this talk with this wonderful project that is going to be released, I guess, pretty time soon by Anaga Nahayanan. It's a typeface called Eli. It's a Tamil variable font. Um, 
question. There are a couple of talks by, by Anaga uh, online. You won't uh, have any difficulties to, to find them. And I really want you to, to look at this wonderful project because it puts a different perspective on what is bold and fat faces. And especially, of course, as you can understand, but it's not something that is only related to Latin uh, typography. And I could tell you about uh, the Edomojis, for instance, uh, and calligraphic uh, writing systems uh, from the 17th, 18th century Japan. So um, this research is now um, making me thinking about a much wider uh, investigation, not only Latin, but other scripts. And that would be good someday to make something, maybe a conference, I don't know, uh, and just to examining the idea of needing bolder, thicker, fatter uh, designs in type, but also in, in other uh, techniques and in different scripts and culture. Thank you. One hour. Thank I hope it so was much. not too painful for you. Uh, I, I know how, how, how sh um, my English is very, very wonky and rusty. So, <laughs> and uh, I hope you enjoyed the, the images uh, at least. Voila. Uh, yeah, no, it, 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 it's amazing. It's, it's so fantastic. I really, it's a really great note to add on, end on as well, like sort of the bringing it to today and into the future. I think it's like a, a really, a uh, great way to think about the research and the history and how the history still affects us and, and to understand the, the legacy of these forms that we have. It's, it's really fantastic. Thank you so much, Sebastian. It's a really thorough and uh, really comprehensive. Uh, I'm gonna take a couple of questions from, from um, what would come in and I'll sort of go, try to go through kind of logically ask like one of the first questions that came in from McNeil Chapman asking um, if all fat face design uh, derived from kind of a, a Bodoni style modern face. Well, I, I, as I explained, I think maybe not accurately, precisely at the beginning of the talk, one can have the idea that uh, there is a modern face template uh, rather than a Bodoni, for instance, but because we are used, uh, I mean, we don't know much about, as I showed all these things, could have been designed at the time. So it looks very messy. And sometimes someone is doing something and everyone is following uh, the trail, I would say. And so the fat face can be uh, a range of different designs, but the reinvention of bold and fat weights uh, at the end of the 19th century, 20th century, roughly, um, American founder types must, might be blamed for that, you know, <laughs> and then developing Bodonis as if Bodoni has been designed regular, semi bold, bold uh, black, etc., weights, you know. So I think it's distorting the view that we have of typography and even more nowadays because of we are in this fascinating phase of development of the variable fonts uh, and everything is just like mercury, you know, and you, you just like you can stretch, you can distort, you can do anything with type on screen. But um, I mean, it's not as obvious as it is. So I would think that there is, of course, a, um, a design path from the, this Dido, Bodoni, uh, modern face, um, gene pool, and from there, there are some designs that were made towards bold and fat faces. So, mm -hmm. in in terms of that, I guess like I had also like just a, a question, and there's a couple a couple of questions that relate to that as well. Um, one is sort of thinking about um, the application. You mentioned like some of these were sort of cut to order. There was like a, a, a a casting process, some of these were made in, in metal, some of these made through brass, some of these are sand casted. Uh, someone was, was curious, like would some of these also translate into stencil? I mean, stencil is obviously like a very different concept, but in terms of the application, right? If if um, if these fat faces started showing up in, in, in other contexts, like uh, drawn or like with stencil ever um, a, a model, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, as I just said, um, many things are happening uh, in different directions uh, during the 19th century. 
And there might, I'm not, I'm not sure if there's, one can make a link between st stencil plates and these brass plates. Um, I, I don't know because it's, it's, it's uh, of course, uh, it's, um, it's a parallel um, trade uh, working from my knowledge uh, in France in the late 18th century and 19th century. And um, well, Eric Kindle uh, did a lot of research on, on, on that. And it looks like there is a specific template, uh, a specific pattern of stencil letter that was made in France uh, in the second half of the 19th century that might have a connection to the French fat face. Uh, so it's possible, but then again, uh, I would say more research would be needed to, to try to find some uh, passages uh, from one process to another or copying, adapting designs in a different process. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of, I guess, like the question I, I ha had in, in sort of looking at the history is in in terms of copying and how much, how close, you know, like a foundry comes out with, with a slightly different style, how quickly was it disseminated and how, I mean, it's in the public eye and so these specimens are created, but how close are these copies being made, you know, in terms of piracy or not piracy, like I'm sure it's all very murky, but have you come across things that like a very identical? Well, I, I just briefly showed you these this two examples between Fawn and, and Castlon and Kafferwood, this four yeah. line spiker. Uh, they are quite close. But the funny thing is that all these founders, you know, they had an association. I don't know uh, if you were aware of that. So, and um, it was called the, the London Master Letters. So, mm -hmm. all these master letters, they would have meetings, you know. So, imagine you have people like William Caslon IV, Henry Caslon, uh, Vincent Figgins, Robert Fawn, uh, Edmund Fry. So the big names of the, the type business in London, and they would have meeting just to agree on the price of type and the wages of the workmen, you know. But of course, I mean, they were looking at each other stuff like we do, I mean, like type designers are doing nowadays. And there was, a, 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 I would say, a cross-pollination that was happening between uh, the, the most eminent members of the type trade, but also, as I said, uh, imagine sign painting, wood cutting, all the other trades that were very likely innovating as well. So, uh, but again, we don't have such big names for sign painting, for wood cutting, engraving. We just find letter forms, examples, and suddenly you have a, something that appears that might be a key uh, design. Um, so it's very difficult because, well, we need a time machine <laughs> very quickly just to sneak in and have a look in London. I would love to be in London in 1805 and see these shop fronts with uh, this sans serif. Uh, but, uh, well, I'm pretty sure there are some um, clues traces in some illustrations, in some engravings, water colors. I'm looking everywhere uh, to find things. But again, uh, it's very, you, you, one needs to be careful not to see what one wants to see. I mean, you, it's very easy to see, oh, this is a, a sans serif, uh, oh, this is a fat face. And, uh, but then um, there's uh, sometimes, uh, I would say, a, a frail border between accuracy and interpretation when you are a graphic artist or draughtsman, you know. And when you see the work of Scharf, but I, I, I wanted to see to show some examples because Scharf is very brilliant and is very interested in any aspects of um, daily life in London. And fortunately, um, all these letter forms, the evolution of the shops. So it's plenty of information and I'm pretty sure yeah, it can give it can give us some hints about the, the, the change of the London streets um, in the 1820s, 1830s. So, and and for the period, the, the first two decades of the 19th century, it's more difficult at the moment to find uh, such uh, um, evocative, clear, insightful examples. But um, I'm not done there. I, I have to go <laughs> dig more at some point, I guess, when I, I can be able to be back to the Great Britain. I missed it very much. 
I, I, in terms of just just thinking about the the the, the form, I, there's a couple of questions that are a little bit more technical, and a couple of questions that are a little bit more broader. I'll, I'll try to combine the two. So there's a question earlier from Marcela Prada: uh, if there's a specific measure of thickness that distinguishes between bold and fat face, you know, I think like sort of where does the line really live? And then I'll follow up with another question. Well, uh, actually, the answer or one possible answer is in this booklet. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I, when I did my research for the PhD, I, I, I got um, this, um, can I say, my colleague Jacques André told me about uh, Peter, Peter Carroll's uh, co K coefficient to measure the weight of a typeface. So this is something that is still not well known, but uh, I, I was very much interested in, in um, using uh, this as um, Peter Caro somehow sketched it and, and my colleague Jacques André uh, used it uh, in one of his books to define, I would say, the graduation from ultralight uh, to fat or black. So uh, when you measure the stems uh, of a letter, capital or lowercase, then you, it can give you an insight about uh, the degree of fatness, for instance, for according to this chart, uh, fat faces, black faces begin uh, at 33 uh, point value of K. But um, um, you have to go into this to, to, to understand. It's, it's very easy. So it's an indication, you know, but of course it's quite subjective to, to, to figure out uh, when the bold is a bold or strong bold, or uh, we are into a real fat face. So. A fat face is a design, but uh, also uh, it's a way of um, designing um, an impactful letter, but people might agree or not agree on what is a fat face again. Um, but it's possible to measure it, I would say. Mm -hmm. I have, for, for those who are interested, I, I, I posted the link to that book with um, at the poem editions. Um, I don't in, in... want to make aggressive advertising, uh, even, even if uh, some, <laughs> some, some aspects of the talk are, are quite uh, related to that. But uh, if you want to know more and to understand about this, you, you, yeah, just, just get into it and that's it. Uh, and then there's another technical question in terms of, uh, from, from Sarah Saskolny um, asked, um, she said, talk to us about bracketing. It seems like there's a clear shift away from softer, more curved serifs to strict hairlines and triangles in the progression of those fat faces. Do you feel like any, have found, uh, any one founder was the source of this or did it happen organically? Well, it's not clear yet. I, I wouldn't say that it, it's... We, we, we are still needing more, more clues uh, before asserting that things happen that way. Um, I mean, it might be a, it might be possible to really sketch uh, again a provisional chronology, but uh, I think, as always, more research is needed, and uh, I'm pretty sure there are other things that will appear in the future, or things that are dormant somewhere. So. And uh, if institutions are able to digitize more and more documents, not only type specimens, and I really want to help in the future to make some of the things that I showed you today, these unique examples of type specimens uh, being digitized so they can be shared to, to a wider community. Um, because for many years I, I was reading about these documents, you know, just like this, as I said, this myth about the 1803 form specimen, the, the, just like where the, the bad stuff is beginning according to Updike and Morrison. And then when you finally can go to Simbride and you can look at these things and then bam, uh, no, <laughs> the fat faces are not coming here. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a couple of questions. That I think that they, it makes sense to combine them in terms of the um, kind of the inherent Brit Britishness in a way of the fat face. But uh, you know, and you talked about like the um, it shows up in the United States, of course, like the the ATF and other founders picked up like the style yeah. of, of fat faces. But is it um, is it as advanced and prevalent in other places like France and in Italy at the time? Um, how how popular did fat faces become in other places? 
Uh, it's another investigation, I would say. I mean, I, 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 I hesitated uh, to show uh, other examples from other countries, especially French stuff, obviously. Uh, and, and after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, um, bold and fat faces, uh, they, they, they began to appear in France and uh, especially at the Royal Printing Office. Um, but, and the institution bought uh, types of mattresses, I don't know, uh, from uh, uh, Castellan and Catherwood and some fry. So, and also they made some adaptation in house uh, of some characters, especially the, the famous L with the middle stroke. Um, so they can bear the mark of the, the Royal Printing Office. But then uh, very quickly, uh, punch cutters uh, began to make uh, these character gras, as I said in French. Uh, and the term gras in, in French is not making the distinction between bold and fat faces, for instance. So it makes it more difficult, you know. Yeah. And, but uh, for instance, there was a, um, a punch cutter called um, Jacques Main, uh, who cut um, board types for a, a, a huge range of board types for the Royal Printing Office in the British new style. And so they were not appreciated at, at the time. It took uh, quite a, a few years. And um, I know also that um, the foundry of Jules Didot in Paris uh, bought some types from Castellon and Livermore. So that's still Castellon and Catherwood. Uh, and so around 1823, 1824, there was um, examples of these British types coming uh, in France and used in different kinds of publications. Uh, not only Fat Faces, but also Castellon's Italian, for instance, uh, another type that, that had a huge influence in France in, in printing. Uh, I, I want to do something about that. Uh, it was copied in many ways. So, but um, overall there is um, a massive research project to undertake about the influence of British typography, this commercial British typography uh, in the rest of Europe. Um, and I think we would be able to learn a lot of things on the subject. And, this, and so the influence of many, many designs in France from the bold and fat types to antique slab serif and uh, the sans serifs as well. So, so maybe I can do another talk someday on the subject when I have more stuff to show. That would uh, be amazing. Well, actually, yeah. I just yeah, I just had like a thought about you. Just mentioned like the the the, the names and the nomenclature, like the, the titles, and this is not something that was a question earlier in, in the Q and A in terms of the like the names like like antique and Tuscan. Like, do you know? Um, like some of the origins for, for those kinds of titles. Cause even like I was just thinking about the, the Binney and Ronaldson uh, 1812 specimen, uh, the American specimen has quite a bit of fat face in it. And in those, there's this distinction between the French style and then British, I, I believe it's called British, but, but certainly they, they call attention to a French style. Can you talk a little bit about like the, like the names like antique and, and sort of, mm -hmm. Well, it's very confusing when you, you begin to, 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 to assess why they decided to call um, Egyptian, that was a name for, uh, I mean, I don't remember which, I think Fawn, for instance, uh, used Egyptian for the slab serifs and Castellan and Catherwood uh, used Antique and Figgins who used Antique. In France, it's the opposite. Um, Egyptian are the slab serif overall. And antique, um, the, the term I think uh, is first appearing around 1838 in France to, de to, to designate the sans serif. Um, antique, yeah, it's for the, any kind of sans serif. And, uh, and I would say some of the types that would be cut in France in the 1830s uh, were made for uh, uh, inscriptional uh, studies, uh, studying Latin inscriptions, for instance. So they would cut there, were, there are a couple of types when you have Latin and Greek, for instance, it's more or less the same design. So they were made for publishers and also the, 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 
the royal printing office again uh, had some of these inscriptional types made uh, in the early 1840s by Marcelin Legrand. Well, it's another subject, you know. And, and uh, but the terms antique uh, is, is someone is coming with this name because in the catalog you would find uh, at the end of the 1830s more of this new sans serif design and then everybody's doing the same thing and is copying the, the name and that's it. So, and everybody agrees that uh, this is an antique category until Vox appears in the 1950s with Lineal in French. But in sign painting, for instance, it's the opposite again. Sign painters in France would use the word Egyptian, Egyptian for the sans serif, you know, so then it's a mess, like life. <laughs> We, it complicates things like obviously uh, for historians oh, yeah. and, and researchers to, to see these yeah, and then yeah. like the the language shift the the, the terminology from english to, yeah. to french-speaking countries to german-speaking countries like the the, the shifts are, are extreme um we probably have just just enough time for one last question i don't okay. want to keep anyone of course in, including yourself sebastian i really appreciate your time um there's one question in um in the chat um that sort of caught my attention too, just in terms of the, it's a question from Scott, uh, did the development in black pigment density affect the use of fat faces? I guess like more specifically, like did the, the innovations in ink have a, a role in that as well, potentially? Um, not ink, but printing. Uh, something I haven't uh, uh, mentioned is the introduction of, of uh, uh, steel printing presses and also in the 1810s, 1820s, you know, stand up, Albion. So it improved the quality of such big types with these metal presses. So it's not so much about ink, but it's about the quality of printing that makes it more possible to, to print uh, all of these big letters. Mm -hmm. That's the main factor, I would say. Mm -hmm. And I, I also caught something in some of the samples, especially some of the earlier samples. I wondered like if in terms of the technology, like there's a quite a few characters, especially some of the round characters that um, don't seem like to have a, a lot of overshoot. Um, so they kind of sit a little bit higher off the baseline and they don't quite, is that sort of a way that you can tell if it's like a wood type? Because I imagine in wood type, it's, it's a little bit harder to create an overshoot because you're, you know, it, it kind of sits squat on there. I don't know if, we, if you've, you've done anything or noticed anything like that. Even no. the 20 R's, like an italic R, the leg just, no. just is like- no. Again, I mean, I, I, I would have to, to, to see the real stuff. Uh, and, and mostly uh, the examples I could see were made from metal types or, or cut uh, from, um, I mean, with uh, these brass patterns or, some casting, but um, I have a lot of uh, research to do and to, to see the, the physical objects. Okay. One of the benefits of the pandemics, if there's one benefit is that I had lots of time to, to look and dig into many online collections. So I found images of this document and um, I hope to be back soon in some of these libraries and collections to see the real objects. So then I can have more uh, information uh, about some examples. So yeah, well, this is something I, I'm planning to do um, not soon because I'm going to put this thing to, to rest because now I'm going to, if everything goes well, I, I'm about to, to, to start working on a couple of books. So it's going to keep me busy for the next couple of years. So Amazing. Well, well yeah. hopefully uh, we can have you back uh, to continue sharing your, your research and your knowledge. It's, it's, it's always yeah. a pleasure to have you here. And it's always so nice to, to kind of dig into something that seems maybe uh, simple or, or understood, but a, a topic like fat face is just a, a fascinating treasure trove of, of content and that you, know, you can keep going and keep going and keep going. So it's a really, really appreciate uh, sharing this insight with you. Um, for folks who want to um, get get hands on the on the pamphlet, uh, please do. We 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 just got a copy for the collection here. Um, it's a really great great little brochure. But uh, take take a look at that. Self promotion is, is uh, especially in this case is very very well well deserved. Sebastian is a fantastic writer uh, and a researcher. So um, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, thank you Sebastian for your time for for your insight for your wisdom.
um stay well everyone stay healthy uh keep yourself yeah, uh, you. in balance uh and we'll see you all soon join us next week on, on a monday for another talk but uh be well uh, thank you again sebastian